Okay, we've been uh, looking at the Hilbert transform, and we discovered in the Hilbert transform another way of deriving a time domain filter from a desired filter uh, characteristic spectrum. Okay, so the idea here is you have some kind of spectrum you'd like. You know, maybe you want to create a certain kind of low pass filter, or maybe a, say a notch filter to take out the sixty hertz. Uh, power line uh, alternating current, and so you you design your desired spectrum. You know, like maybe for a notch filter, you'd like you'd like to keep all of the um, um, you'd like to keep all of the uh, um, frequencies except sixty hertz. Okay, and maybe you know there's there's always overtones at 120, 180, uh, 240, and so forth. So you might take those out too. So you design the spectrum that you, you want your filter to work on. And then um, there's the question, OK, I want a, I want a causal filter. Um, and maybe I even want a minimum phase filter. So that means that, that I have to, um, you know, the, the spectrum isn't enough. Okay? I'm not going to be, to have a causal filter, I can't filter in the frequency domain. You know, if I was in the frequency domain, I could I could just apply that that notch. I could I could take my data, Fourier transform it. Uh, the part that I want to cut out, I could uh, I could multiply those Fourier components by zero, and uh, and I'd be done, right? And then you inverse transform it, and you find out that you've got you know big uh, big arrivals before your first arrival, and so it's kind of unsatisfactory. It's kind of messed up the timing. It's messed up the physics of your whole uh, causal seismogram. Okay, so. Uh, the idea is, uh, all right, in addition to the amplitude spectrum, uh, the other thing you need to define a full um, time domain waveform or time domain filter is a phase spectrum. And the Hilbert transform gives us a way of getting that. And in fact, it even gives us a way of getting that that is minimum phase. Okay? And we got that through taking the, uh, the log of the amplitude spectrum and it turns out that uh, you know after taking the log of the amplitude spectrum, there's a, a sort of a maximum phase or, or multi-phase uh, uncertainty in the definition. And if we just take take that out, okay, if we just ignore it, then we're going to by definition end up with a minimum phase filter, where this phase spectrum is going to be the minimum phase uh, spectrum that. That belongs that goes along with that desired amplitude spectrum A, and so what we really have here is a, you know, this uh, integral um, scaled by minus one over pi, integrating uh, the log of of A, the amplitude spectrum, over uh, omega minus uh, uh, zeta, uh, d zeta, right? So we're we're integrating over along the frequency axis. Right, because we have a at every frequency zeta, and we're we're deriving you know with one integral here we're deriving uh, the uh, uh, we're deriving the uh, phase spectrum at some known frequency or selected frequency omega. Okay, so there you, that's how you have omega minus zeta, and um, so uh, uh, as long as the log doesn't go. Um, if the amplitude spectrum is zero, right, then we can't take its logs. We can't use this, which means that that whatever filter design we make, we can't completely take out all um, uh, you know all of any frequency. You know, we got to leave one percent at least. You know, maybe more. Okay, um, and also uh, we got to be careful in integrating uh, along. Um, um, at frequencies that are close to the desired frequency omega, right? That's kind of weird, right? Because the frequencies that are close to our to the frequency we're integrating at uh, are going to be the trickiest to integrate. So uh, there's some difficulties here, but uh, the Hilbert transform is now pretty well known, and uh, uh, you might even, you know, certainly in uh, MATLAB or uh, um, uh, or numerical recipes, whatever you're using, you'll find a Hilbert transform algorithm. So uh, you know you can derive that phase spectrum that you need. You know you can combine that with the amplitude spectrum that you've designed, uh, and then invert that into a uh, uh, a time domain filter. Okay, that then you apply by convolution.
and um, um, and it's the uh, minus the Hilbert transform of the um, the log of the amplitude spectrum. Okay, so quite quite a simple uh, quite a simple uh, uh, algorithm here. Okay, now um, that's the filter design implication of um, of the uh, <coughs> Hilbert transform. Uh, there's another application that I want to get to right away because uh, we use it a lot. All right, and um, this is the role of the Hilbert transform in generating what we call the analytic signal. Okay, um, so uh, the the uh, uh, the thing we know already is that we have an x, you know, a time series, an input x of t that's only real. Okay, and thinking about you know how what it means to have phase and frequency and all that, um, we realize that it's kind of incomplete. I mean, sure, yeah, it it it, it uh, represents all the data we have. You know, that's all the reality we have. But we can make it uh, very easy to work with if we define this x hat. So it's a signal that is instead of being just real, it's complex. Okay, and so uh, you know to be complex, we've got to have a real part and an imaginary part, and so of course we make the real part equal to, of course, just the 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 input x. Okay, and how do we create an imaginary part that's useful? Well, in in this definition, we're going to make the imaginary part minus the Hilbert transform of x. Okay, and this Hilbert transform, of course. Is uh, is taken not on the not on the frequency axis, but on, on the time axis. It's the Hilbert transform in time. Okay. Now, now, what what does this do? What is this? Why do we use this? Okay. And, and having um, uh, you know having uh, a complex signal x hat, we call that a uh, analytic signal. Okay. And uh, What's analytic about it is that it represents all possible phase shifts of x. Okay, so it's it's kind of like duplicating. It's 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 not adding any information, of course. It just makes it easier to work with. Okay, so uh, you can just see the 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 um, uh, you know the analytic signal has purportedly twice as much information in it as the real signal, uh, but the um, uh, the imaginary part is just, you know, the a, a Hilbert transform version of the of of the uh, of the same data. So uh, there really isn't more information in there, but it's very convenient to have it in this analytic complex form. Okay. Now, now, what do I mean by by phase shifts? All right. And there are uh, uh, for those of you um, who um, who have studied uh, uh, seismic interpretation. There are these uh, so-called phases of seismic waves, okay, and and what this has to do is with is uh, is where do you where do you call the the uh, the actual time that you would pick, okay, and and you know we're leaving behind the concept of minimum phase here for for a while, okay, um, in terms of the the signal. Um, and you know most uh, most seismic interpretation is done now on zero phase data. Okay. Now what that means, unlike the way I've drawn it here, right? It, it, I, I'm kind of beginning the the zero phase hump at uh, zero time. Uh, and really, what I should have done is plotted it with zero time, the zero time axis, you know, just going right at the center of the hump. Okay. And and what you pick as the as the arrival time of a zero phase reflection wavelet is the peak amplitude. It's at the peak amplitude that you, you pick the time. Now, now, the reason that's used so much in, in interpretation is because that's, uh, that enables you to pick many more reflections more accurately because you're picking off the most obvious part of the wave. right? If you had noise and you were trying to pick this if this wasn't a zero phase wavelet, and you were say it was a, actually a minimum phase wavelet, and you were trying to pick, you know, just where it rises above the noise, that is a far trickier proposition, 
and you're not going to be able to make such accurate time picks as you know picking it right at the peak. That's where it's going to show above the noise the best. All right, so so that's why we interpret zero phase data usually. Um, okay, now 180 degree uh, phase data is really just taking the zero phase wavelet and multiplying by minus one. Okay, so that's easy. All right, um, and and again, you know, you could pick the uh, you could pick the um, uh, you could pick the the uh, reflection at the bottom of the trough instead of the the, the top of the peak. All right, uh, and and there's a you know been a long-standing argument between uh, Texans and uh, um, and and uh, uh, and the Dutch about uh, you know which way you should plot your data for which kind of reflection, and we we talk about that in in uh, Trexler and I talk about that in the class uh, that we sometimes give on seismic interpretation. Um, now in between, okay, so uh, uh, in between you have what's what's known as a ninety degree phase uh, uh, wavelet, okay. Now, if you think about, let's say, let's say the zero phase wavelet is our is what we started with. If you differentiate it once, right on the upswing, you have positive derivative. As it's swinging down, you got a negative derivative, right? And and right where right at the peak, that's where the slope changes, and so the reflector is located actually at the zero crossing here. Now, that's also uh, uh, you know ninety degree phase is not a bad way to do picking. Um, you know, because sometimes the zero crossings are quite obvious, um, but um, uh, zero phase is one out as being you know more generally useful. Okay. Um, now you can also imagine a uh, a uh, minus ninety degree phase wavelet, right? And and also think you know a minus one hundred eighty degree phase wavelet is exactly the same as a one hundred eighty degree phase phase wavelet uh, to um, a three sixty Degree phase wavelet is exactly the same as a zero phase wavelet. Okay, um, and uh, uh, all right. And, and another concept here: if we start with zero phase, we differentiate with respect to time once, we get ninety degree phase. We differentiate again, we take the second derivative, and we get one hundred eighty degree phase wavelet. If we differentiate again, we would have a two seventy degree phase wavelet, or minus, which is the same as minus ninety. Right, we differentiate again. We pay back to zero phase. Okay, so this is connected to the. Uh, uh, it's connected to the derivatives of the wavelet. It's connected to, um, uh, to how easy it is to pick. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, we like to have some control over what, you know, where our our reflection times appear and, and what you know where the wavelet is. Okay, and what phase it has. Now, uh, I could draw this out in a phase diagram, but I, I hope it's clear that each of these is a rotation of an analytic signal on the complex plane. Okay, so uh, uh, we'll we'll take a look at that um, uh, after uh, we discuss it some more. Okay, so uh, you know how do we get the analytic signal? And and of course, you know this is a procedure that's done. Um, that's done, uh, you know, billions of times every day, uh, you know, when, when people are examining uh, uh, reflection seismograms for uh, for what are called instantaneous attributes, which are one of the foundations of of all sorts of different kinds of attributes, uh, of more complicated at attributes. Okay, so um, all right, in the Fourier domain, okay, so here we've made this definition. Now let's take the definition and Fourier transform it. So we're going to Fourier transform x hat to capital X hat. We're going to Fourier transform x to x of omega. And then we're going to take the Fourier transform of minus the Hilbert transform of, uh, of, of x. Okay. And um, you know, again, we're using those wonderful linear properties of the Fourier transform. Doesn't matter whether we split up our data into real and imaginary part or or what it all comes out. We add it together in, in the time domain. We can also add it together in the frequency domain. So here, these are the complex Fourier transforms 
uh, capital X hat of omega, X hat of omega, that's the Fourier transform of the data. And then the Fourier transform of minus the, uh, uh, the Hilbert transform of X, if you look back at the, uh, at the definition of the, uh, 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 and the Fourier transform of the, uh, um, of the Hilbert transform, you see it's extremely simple. It's the complex Fourier transform of X times signum of omega. Okay, very very similar. Remember, signum is just uh, you know at, at at negative omegas it's negative one, at zero it's zero, and at uh, um, at positive omega it's uh, it's it's positive one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we factor out x here, right? This these are just you know x at omega is a complex number, x hat at omega is a complex number, and one plus signum of omega. Is a real number, which of course we can add to a complex. We can multiply it by a complex number, no problem. Okay, and this we just have to run this for, you know, at each uh, frequency omega. So this this takes you know exactly capital N operations. It's pretty cheap once we have the Fourier transform. So we take uh, the Fourier transform. We we multiply it by one plus signum of omega at each omega, and that gives us the Fourier transform of um, of uh, the analytic signal, so you know we take the Fourier transform, we double the positive frequencies and zero the negative frequencies. Okay, how about that? And then we just inverse transform, you know, from frequency to time, and we get a complex. Um, you know, if we had just inverse transform the Fourier transform of X, we would get a you know the imaginary part would be would be uh, would be zero. But of course, that doesn't happen with the uh, um, that doesn't happen with the the, uh, uh, the the analytic signal. You know, we end up with a with a very much non-zero imaginary part. Okay, because we've you know we've essentially filtered it in the frequency domain by this one plus signal. Okay, so uh, you know that's all there is to it. Um, there are. Um, there are more ways to do this than this, but this is by far the simplest way. Um, and given the fast Fourier transform, it's going to be a very efficient way. So, um, and 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 uh, in in a minute, uh, you know what what Clairbaut likes to do, and and you know maybe I should rearrange it, but he likes to uh, introduce uh, a little theory. But the, b before he talks about the real application, which is filter design. You know, he goes to this very common application, and he sort of sets it up, and and then he leaves it to as a as an as an exercise to the student to kind of, you know, complete thinking about okay, what are all the things I could do with that analytic signal? All right, we'll look at some of those, but later. Okay, so what what Clairbaut is really interested in here is is exploring this Hilbert transform. Okay, and now that we know how to get the Hilbert transform easily. Okay, in the Fourier domain, um, what every time there's a new transform, um, what Clairbaut and I like to do is figure out what is its impulse response. If you feed this transform, you know, one single data point, what's what are you going to get out? Okay, so what do you get out if you feed the Fourier transform one single data point? Everything's zero except at one single time. You've got some amplitude. Yeah, yeah. So that's the Fourier transform of, of the. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. That's the impulse response of the Fourier transform. And so the first thing Clairbaut wants to know about this, you know, new to us Hilbert transform is, what is its impulse response? Okay. So, um, uh, all right. In uh, in sample time, right, we have uh, uh, the the impulse response of the of the Hilbert transform. Is uh, we'll call it h of t, so it's a time series h, okay, and it's going to be the inverse Fourier transform of, and the impulse here is i signum of omega, okay. So we'll 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 here's the the inverse Fourier transform as defined by Clairbaut, okay, with one over two pi, and and we're going to integrate over one principal fold, 
okay, of omega, right? We're going to integrate <laughs> over uh, d omega. So, so one principal fold will take us from minus pi up to pi, okay, one time around the, the unit circle. Uh, and we're integrating i sign of omega, and then here's our, our Fourier uh, um, exponential, e to the i omega t, I'm uh, sorry, minus i omega t, right? It's an inverse Fourier transform from omega back to time. And um, um, so now, now we just break out those, uh, those parts uh, separately, uh, right? Because signum is a very simple function. Signum of omega is very simple. So uh, we can factor out a 1 over t. So we have 1 over 2 pi t. And then uh, uh, we have a minus 1 from the, um, um, uh, from, from the combination where uh, omega is negative. We have an e to the i t pi and an e to the minus i t pi. And then there's a, another minus 1. Okay, And we put that together. All right. So, so uh, uh, now t is, um, uh, and, and it's easier to think of this. You know, t is is a is a uh, an index. Okay. So um, uh, this this impulse response of the uh, Hilbert transform h of t. Okay, for an even t, an even uh, time index, it's zero. For an odd time index. It's equal to minus two over pi t. Well, that's pretty weird, right? So, um, you know, at zero, it's zero. At one, it's like uh, minus two over pi. All right. And uh, uh, at um, you know, if you take it to, to a very small uh, time, you know, it's gonna it's gonna blow up. Right, and it's going to blow up on the other side at a very small negative time, and you go out to a very large time, and still at every even time, right, it's uh, equal to zero, right, because of, of what's happening here, right, the i t pi's. Um, but for uh, uh, for an odd time, it's just going to be some small number, right, because t is large. So so it's this weird uh, cone function, right. That uh, it looks like uh, the part that's not zero looks like minus one over t, okay, and and it just goes out, you know, decreases slowly as as one over t, and it's undefined near t equals zero. So I mean, convolving with this sucker would be really difficult, um, and I don't, you know, somebody has probably figured out how to uh, <clears throat> how to do a. Uh, um, uh, a recursive uh, solution for the uh, Hilbert transform, um, you know, convolving by the Hilbert transform. Somebody's probably done it. Uh, I don't know whether it's useful or not, but uh, you you can't find, even find out unless you can actually do it accurately enough. Okay. Um, so uh, um, it's uh, uh, it's it's. Uh, um, uh, you know, I don't. I don't think Clairbout has come up with a use for this uh, impulse response of the Hilbert transform, but uh, it's very instructive at least to know what it looks like. Okay, and this is what it what it looks like. Okay, so let's go on to further applications of the analytic signal. All right, uh, and the first one is uh, you know suppose you. Uh, you find that all your seismic data is at say 30 degrees, and you want to shift it back to zero degrees, okay, to to give the interpreter a better chance of understanding it. All right. So um, you want to shift the phase. You want to rotate the phase, okay. So we'll call the phase shifted uh, time series x prime of t. Okay, it's a static rotation of all components in the complex plane, and and look at this. It's just done very simply, um, you know, time point by time point. All right, so uh, we have the analytic signal. You know, we, we start with x of t, and we get its analytic signal x hat of t, and then um, 
we have our, uh, our phase rotation epsilon. Okay, So we take this complex number, which is the analytic signal. We multiply it by the complex number, which is e to the i epsilon. Okay, Just another complex number, right? It's, it's uh, uh, cosine epsilon plus i sine epsilon. right? So we just multiply those two complex numbers together, take the real part, and that's our rotated real seismogram. Okay, it's not complex anymore because we took the real part. Uh, and and if you draw that out in a in a in, a fa in phase space, you know, against the unit circle, I think you'll you'll see how that works. Okay, so that's how to uh, rotate phase. Now let's uh, let's look at uh, instantaneous attributes. Um, all this stuff, of course, is available in Open Detect if you want to play with it. Uh, we can load some data into Open Detect and. And uh, and then you can uh, you can rotate you can and you can get any of these instantaneous attributes, and of course they've you know this is a very simple um, you know we're looking at very simple algorithms for these attributes um, you know there are uh, uh, all kinds of refinements that that people have done to make the the attributes work work nice and smoothly on on noisy data. Okay, but we gotta we gotta understand first what they are. Okay, so we've got our analytic signal. All right, we've got uh, the real data sitting on the real part, and minus the Hilbert transform of the real data is sitting on the imaginary part. This imaginary part, you know, minus the Hilbert transform of x, we're going to call it y. So our um, our ana analytic signal x hat is equal to x plus i y of t. So there's a complex number, you know, x at t plus i y of t uh, at every time. All right, so we got a complex trace. Okay. Um, now, what does this uh, what does this mean? Uh, you know, why did we use this term analytic? Um, it's still causal. It's free of poles inside the unit circle. Okay, uh, and it's also one sided in the Fourier domain. Right. We we actually guaranteed that. Um, by multiplying by that uh, that signum function, okay. So uh, uh, and and if it had poles inside the unit circle, right, it would it would blow up, right. I mean this this analytic signal, I mean that's a that's a time series, and we can z transform it just like anything else, right. And it's got you know it's we could factor it into its poles and zeros, and uh, you know whatever they are, and it's. Um, uh, but it's a it's a physical it's a physical signal, right? So it's not going to blow up forever. You know, it's got some limited amount of energy. So um, um, you know, it's uh, uh, that's part of what it means to be analytic is that it's not blowing up. Okay, we can apply you know analysis to it. Okay, if it was a if it had poles inside the unit circle, it'd be blowing up. We can't we can't apply much to it. Can't do much with it. All right, that's why we call it analytic. All right, so there's this uh, envelope or instantaneous amplitude. Okay, and what is that? That is the the envelope function of t is the magnitude of the analytic signal at each time. So at each time we just go through and we we square x and we add it to the square of y. And we take the square root of the whole thing. Right. So the envelope is always positive, and uh, and uh, uh, could be zero, but it's always uh, it's always zero or positive. All right. And the envelope squared. Look at that. That's like an instantaneous energy, right? That's a uh, uh, that might be called the uh, instantaneous energy. Um, and that is uh, uh, just the analytic x hat times the conjugate, um, the uh, the conjugate of uh, of x hat. Okay, at that one time, and giving us the envelope squared at that one time. Um, notice that the in envelope is independent of the phase shift. Okay, whatever the phase of the wavelet, right? Since it's the length of the complex number, right? It's uh, it's kind of wrapping around all possible phase shifts of the uh, of the um, uh, of that little wavelet. The envelope is this is this dotted. Uh, dotted line, okay, dashed line, and then here's a 90 degree or minus 90 degree phase shift. Here's a zero degree phase shift. Right at zero degrees, it does match the envelope. 
Okay. Um, and, and how is that? All right. Here's our phase shifted wave, right? But the uh, the envelope is is just uh, the magnitude of the uh, of the analytic signal times the uh, phase shift exponential, right? Uh, at that time, and uh, of course, you know that's the magnitude of e to the i epsilon times the magnitude of x hat, and of course the magnitude of e uh, times i epsilon e to the i epsilon. The magnitude of that is one for for any possible epsilon, right? Um, because you're just taking the uh, uh, the sine squared uh, or the cosine squared of epsilon plus the sine squared of epsilon, and and that's always equal to one, right? So, um, you know, the that's how the envelope is independent of the phase shift. Um, here's some applications. Um, you can pick arrival times from the envelope to avoid phase shift effects, and it turns out we want to preserve some of the phase shift effects. You know that might identify reservoirs, for instance. So we 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 uh, pick arrival times from zero phase wavelets. We we rotate them to zero phase. Um, no, we will rotate the whole data set to zero phase. Okay, we won't re we won't rotate wavelet by wavelet. We'll rotate the whole of the data set so that uh, you know simple reflectors will become zero phase, and then interesting reservoir related reflectors will become. Um, you know, say ninety degree phase. That's quite. It's quite common. Um, then we uh, uh, we can we can another, another thing we can do is we can measure the envelope to scale the data without altering the phase. Okay. So uh, uh, you know the the best uh, the best uh, measurement of of what the actual amplitude of the data are is um, uh, we get from the envelope rather than. Uh, Rather than than actual amplitudes, because they're going to vary between, you know, a ninety degree phase wavelet and a zero phase wavelet, uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, envelope squared is proportional to the instantaneous energy. All right, and there's other you know physical factors about the sensor and so so forth that we need to know. You know, we know the calibration of the of the instruments of the system before we can we can actually get the energy in in joules or whatever. But uh, it's certainly proportional to it, and we can. Very easily use it like that, okay, um, and, and you know very usefully the envelope is is uh, always greater than or equal to zero. We can get an instantaneous phase, all right, uh, and and like I said, uh, you know re identifying reservoirs by these interesting ninety degree phase wavelets is uh, you know that's that's actually discovered a lot of oil. Um, and so, how do we get the phase? You know, how how do we tell when when the the wavelet is at ninety degrees phase? Okay, and it becomes interesting. Well, there's uh, uh, there we can get an instantaneous phase, and that's one of the first things you know that I really want to do with some of our geothermal data is look at these these reservoirs, these geothermal reservoirs, not oil reservoirs, and and say, well, you know, if if the whole data set, you know, if a simple reflector, you know, say from the bottom of the alluvium. Uh, or from the water bottom is um, is uh, zero phase in the data set. Then what is the phase of the of the reservoir? Okay, is it ninety degrees? You know what is it? Uh, is it still zero phase? You know maybe we maybe we found nothing, but we got to check it out. Okay, um, so we still need to do that. Um, so uh, okay, we got our analytic signal. It's got it's got an x and y component. Right, so the phase is just the inverse tangent of y over x. Okay, and um, as uh, as Kyle Gray is working on right now, um, there are some interesting lateral reflection phase shifts um, in in his data set, which are caused by uh, maybe faulting, uh, maybe the uh, the ore bodies. Uh, hard to say. You know, we got to. You've got to let him finish his thesis and work that out. But uh, uh, you know, essentially, variations in reflection coefficients will cause phase shifts. So whatever varies reflection coefficient um, will uh, will do this. Uh, I thought of another application for the envelope. Okay, um, you know, what if you're uh, what if you're trying to calculate a um, um, an earthquake uh, magnitude? Okay, a local magnitude. 
what you really want to use for the amplitude is is not some you know phase modified uh, raw waveform. You really want to use the envelope, okay, to calculate the uh, uh, you know to, to most to most stably calculate the uh, the local magnitude. Um, you know the envelope will give you the most most stable amplitude measurement. So uh, that would be uh, that would be one thing to look into. I, I bet it's already used. Okay, uh, but I'm not sure. You know that's not part of the uh, classical uh, Richter uh, amplitude, but uh, a Richter magnitude calculation. But uh, uh, maybe it would be. Uh, I, I'm sure there's been some theses written on that. Maybe it's uh, what we use already. Okay. Well, if you can get phase, then if you can take a time derivative of the phase, right? Uh, d phi dt versus t, right? So now this is a little bit more uh, complex uh, uh, attribute. It's not notice, notice uh, envelope. You know, it's calculated entirely independently at every time sample, right? This equation only relies on one time sample. Um, phase, it's it's uh, entirely different, entirely independently calculated at every single time sample. All right. We talk about you know doing the time derivative of the phase though to get the the frequency right, and now we are we are having to, you know, look at ranges of time samples. Okay, you know how do you do that? And we, you know we'll talk about finite difference techniques uh, later on, um, but uh, you know you've got to you've got to involve other time steps here, and there there's also some fancier uh, uh, attributes that are not instantaneous like. Like uh, amplitude, phase, and frequency, um, and and they're not even uh, you can't compute uh, an attribute such as uh, uh, oh, what is it called coherence uh, or you know, coherence you can calculate with one seismogram, but you need several seismograms together to calculate uh, uh, things like roughness, you know, um, and uh, uh, there are fault detectors. Uh, Maybe it's trace-to-trace uh, -trace coherence. That's actually what it is. Um, you know, that show if there's offsets between traces that might be due to faults, for instance, in your uh, in your data volume. Um, okay, so the, so frequency is the first one that that you can't calculate just with one point, right? You can calculate the phase at, at one time point, but you got to reach out to time points uh, ahead and behind to uh, uh, to calculate the time derivative of the phase. Okay. Now, now let's. Uh, all right. So that's you know we can start imagining lots of uh, ways of doing that. Recall a polar definition of the. Uh, um, you know, let's create a polar definition for the uh, the analytic frequency. Uh, the analytic uh, 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 signal. Okay. So x hat of t. So x hat is equal to. Um, some uh, uh, some radius uh, r that that is scaling the uh, uh, the the phase, uh, which is e to the i to the power of i times phi. All right. So the uh, r is like the magnitude, and um, um, and uh, phi is the phase. Okay, at that particular time. Right. So this is this is. We can look at it one time. All right. Now let's take let's take the log, the natural log ln, of both sides of this definition. Okay. So the log of, of x hat is equal to the natural log of the magnitude of, of r. Okay. Which has got to be, um, you know, we're not going to allow r to be complex, but I, I'm just putting the uh, the bars here for uh, completeness. Okay. Plus the natural log of e to the i phi, and of course that is uh, the the natural log of e to the i phi is i phi, right? So we have um, uh, the log of x hat is equal to the natural log of r plus i phi, okay? And the uh, the phase is now the if we take the imaginary part of this, right? Uh, then that's just the phase, right? So the phase is taking the imaginary part of the natural log of the analytic signal, 
and it, and that's just you know that's just one complex number. We take the natural log of the complex number, we get the phase, okay, uh, in the imaginary part. So in implementing this, okay, uh, we've defined that the uh, um, the time derivative of the phase is the uh, is the frequency. Okay, that's what we want is omega of t at t instantaneously, and so. Um, Okay, we put in this definition, right? So we're taking the time derivative of the imaginary part of the log of x hat, okay? And the imaginary part can come, you know, through the uh, the time derivative. So we can take the derivative underneath the imaginary part. So we'll have the we'll take the imaginary part of the derivative of the log of x hat, okay? And um, uh, and so, uh, 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 what we've uh, uh, okay, we take the derivative of the log of x hat, right? By the chain rule, we get uh, uh, one over x hat times the derivative of x, okay? And and then we take the imaginary part. Ah, well, this is really a lot. This is much easier to calculate than the uh, inverse tangent, and I'm sure this is how Open Detect does it. Um, and uh, uh, probably uh, uh, you know a little bit more sophistication, but uh, um, this is uh, uh, this is quite stable, right? Now, if if um, if the magnitude of the analytic signal is zero, then then this won't work, right? Um, but that's pretty rare, okay? So. Uh, you know, you really have to have. Uh, uh, you know, does the envelope ever really go to zero? Well, in real data, hardly ever. You know, or maybe never, in real data. So that's not too bad. Um, of course, that means that the phase is going to be pretty. You know, where the where the uh, the envelope is uh, is small. Uh, that's going to add a lot of instability to your uh, to your uh, uh, frequency. And so that's why, like in Open Detect, you'll see a uh, an envelope scaled um, phase, okay, where they've where they've uh, um, you know kind of kind of toned down the parts that are uh, that have a very small envelope, all right. Um, and then you you know all you have to do is is differentiate in time this complex uh, analytic signal. And that's that's much easier to uh, to do than uh, um, uh, than to first get the uh, uh, the inverse tangent right. Take this ratio, do the inverse tangent right. Every time y or every time x goes to zero, you got a problem, right? Which means that every zero crossing, you can't compute the phase, right? So that's that's a problem. Um, but if you're computing the, uh, uh, it's only when the the envelope goes to zero that you have a problem this way. Okay, so that's a very that's a much more stable way of calculating the instantaneous frequency. Now, what is this really going to be? You know, this is really going to be a predominant frequency, and I think this little example will will illustrate this. So let's let's create a simple analytic signal. It's just a sinusoid, a complex sinusoid. So x hat now we'll create it as this is not a definition here. This is just a, an example. Okay, some x zero times e to the power of i omega t. So it's a it's a complex sinusoid. You know, it's cosine omega t uh, plus i sine omega t. All right. So we got a sinusoid, and we put that through. Right. We uh, um, we take the uh, uh, we put it through this formula for the uh, frequency. Right. And uh, so we have uh, e to the i omega t. We take its uh, um, its time derivative. Right. So uh, um, We've got uh, one over x zero there. Uh, there's x zero e to the i omega t by the chain rule. There's i omega right as the derivative with respect to t, um, and then uh, uh, the um, uh, one over uh, uh, let's see one over x zero is is x zero there. Oh, oh yeah, that's that's where the chain rule came in the e to the minus i omega t. Um, so uh, you know those two cross out, right? The x zero crosses out the x zero, 
we have i omega. We take the imaginary part of i omega, and that's omega. And so, you know, if we start with a sinusoid and we do the the uh, the uh, you know this technique with the um, with the instantaneous frequency, then we get the uh, we get the proper answer. We get omega. Okay. Now, of course, our data contain you know a whole spectrum of frequencies, and so um, what uh, what the instantaneous frequency is going to give us is an average or peak frequency. Okay, and it's really it's really one measurement. You know, it's not a full spectrum. Okay, that you can also do kind of like a moving window uh, spectrum, and um, uh, and you can get the whole uh, you know at every time you can get the whole frequency spectrum. Which is another way of uh, it's a different analysis in that, uh, but uh, you know the instantaneous frequency is just one, you know one frequency number at, at each time. Uh, now, um, okay, I mentioned that we have problems with you know calculating the imaginary part of one over x hat uh, dx hat dt. We have problems if if the magnitude of x is small, if the envelope is small, okay. And and so this is why in calculating the frequency you often uh, get to set a window parameter because you got to decide all right how many time points am I going to kind of smooth over this for okay because uh, you know maybe uh, depending on your data maybe maybe uh, your especially the simpler data um, you know after stacking filtering and, and all that um, you know you might you in your in your uh, you know Image data volumes, you might find uh, a lot of zero crossings uh, or a lot of zeros in the in the magnitude of x hat. Okay, so uh, uh, what you'll do is you'll find a smooth instantaneous frequency, which is taking the imaginary part of all this. Okay, so here we're kind of uh, you know we still divided by x hat there, but we're normalizing, right? We put this this uh, uh, to keep the denominator from going to zero. Okay. We uh, uh, we multiply both the numerator and the denominator by this uh, sum of energy, right? Uh, kind of the the um, the sum of uh, of x hat conjugate uh, over several time points, at least. You know, some window. It could be one second. It could be it could be five milliseconds. You know, depending on your data set. Uh, it's one of those adjustable parameters you got to play with. Okay, and you. Um, uh, and you also divide uh, numerator and denominator by uh, the uh, sum over those same endpoints of the same uh, x uh, x hat conjugate. Okay, uh, you know, and and uh, in Clairbout's uh, uh, example, he only uses n equals three, so you know it's hardly it's hardly that much more work. Okay, um, and in Open Detect, you can you can adjust this you know to whatever. You know, amount of time you want. Um, all right, how do we uh, how do we use these instantaneous attributes? Um, uh, first of all, uh, you might run it in the field as you're collecting data, for to get a quick view of of whether you're getting uh, you know high frequency reflections. Okay, you wanna you wanna look at the instantaneous frequency um, at um, uh, you know, in, in every in every uh, shot gather, uh, just to see whether these hyperbolic reflections you're getting are they are they all you know low resolution, low frequency, or are you getting some high frequency, high resolution uh, reflections in there? Okay, so that's a quality control issue. You know, if you're not getting enough high frequency, then then you might uh, uh, say, all right, we got to do a few more shots here. We got to do a few more uh, vibe uh, activations at this point. Uh, so that could be uh, nice and quick. Um, also, uh, uh, the way that uh, um, money's been made with instantaneous frequency is uh, within a reservoir. Say, uh, if your reservoir is a kind of subtle channel, uh, you don't really see the, the thickness of the channel or even the walls of the channel um, <clears throat> in, uh, in the data itself. But uh, where the data, where the the size of reflection waves are are uh, reverberating within a thicker channel, versus uh, uh, you know where the channel is thick enough that it's approximately the same size as the seismic wavelength, 
you'll get these rever reverberations and you'll get this frequency tuning. And so suddenly, um, you know, one particular frequency will pop out and become really prominent at the channel. And so you make a, a map, you know, say along your major uh, uh, reflector, you make a map of instantaneous frequency, you know, over area, and you see those peaks in instantaneous frequency, and you drill there. Okay, awful lot of money's been made that way. Um, another way that it's been used is to, uh, and this is. Uh, in earthquake seismology, to characterize attenuation effects. Okay, so you you watch instantaneous frequency drop with distance, you know, say from the earthquake, and um, you know, say just in the in the regular PN phase, and and then you can you can make a model of attenuation. Okay, whether it's from you know you still got to figure out whether it's from intrinsic attenuation or or scattering, but you get your attenuation data. Uh, also, it's used for uh, instantaneous frequency is used for seismic recorder triggering algorithms, right? So you might see uh, you know lots of hundred hertz, thirty hertz uh, um, waves coming through your your seismic station, and um, uh, and you don't you know you don't want to trigger a, a recording like a like a high rate strong motion recorder, you know if you're not able to telemeter the data, then you've got to you got to save data you know at the recorder, you know and pick it up later. Um, and uh, you know this 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 doesn't work that well. So you know Ken Smith's on a campaign to make sure that every recorder is is not triggered and and is uh, uh, is telemetered directly back here. Um, but you know just in terms of recognizing an event, you know when an earthquake wave wave comes through, then you're going to see you know much lower frequencies dominate. Okay, then then come from traffic or lightning strikes or thunder or whatever. So um, you know, seeing that instantaneous frequency suddenly go down and be stable at a much lower level uh, is a is a good, uh, uh, really good criterion for deciding. Oh, that's an earthquake coming in. Okay, so uh, very useful in uh, in exploration and network seismology. And that is enough for today.